Our criminal justice system is a unique balance of moving parts, forces tasked with protecting the community at large, as well as the rights of the accused. Constitutional rights, the public's right to prosecute, the accused's right to a competent defense, and the opportunity to prove remorse and rehabilitation. All four voices will be heard when they come together for a special insights conversation, Does the System Work? This live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Laura Yamada. Well, ongoing reports of aging prison facilities and severe overcrowding, crime driven by widespread drug use, repeat offenders who continue to break the law with dozens of prior convictions. All of these realities threaten public safety, and there are serious concerns about whether we're too overwhelmed to provide effective recovery and rehabilitation for the offenders who want to change their lives. So does our local criminal justice system work? Tonight's guest panel includes individuals who work within this vast and complicated system on a daily basis, a circuit court judge, a prosecuting attorney, a public defender, and an advocate for upholding the civil rights of individuals. So we look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you're gonna find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests. Rom Trader is a former prosecutor and now a judge of the First Circuit Court. John Jack Tonaki is the state public defender. He has been with the office since 1985. Chasset Sapolu is the first deputy prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu. And Mateo Caballero is the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us and for your vast experience here at this table. We really appreciate all of you being here. So let me just kind of throw out a very broad question that may take up the half of the, half of the show to, for you to answer, but um, just to kind of set the stage a little bit. We're talking about 30,000 people um, here in Hawaii behind bars or under the criminal justice supervision in Hawaii, actually some of them outside of Hawaii as well. So all of you, you all play different roles um, in the criminal justice system. Uh, you live with the good, you live with the bad, you see both sides of it, uh, and, and the realities of how the system works on a daily basis. So let me just throw this out there first. Uh, in your overall opinion, do you feel like the system works right now? I don't know who wants to jump in first. <laughs> I know it's a broad question we're starting with. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, I, I do think that the system works, you know, but just like any institution, we, there's always room for improvement, and uh, there's, there's areas in our system that we can always work on to improve, and I think some of the issues we were, were planning on talking about uh, revolve, uh, revolve around these issues, bail reform, prison overcrowding. There are areas that we can work on to improve the system to make it work better, but uh, overall, I think the system does work. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with, with Chasset that, um, you know, we, we do collaborate on a lot of different projects to make the system work better. Um, examples of these are uh, what they call specialty courts, drug, the drug court uh, project, the veterans treatment court, the mental health court, and most recently our community court project which is a great success. So, and that was specifically designed to uh, assist in our uh, homeless situation. So, you know, um, there are problems, of course, uh, as Chas had said, but overall, I think uh, our system, especially locally here in, in our state, is uh, a, a, a very good one as compared to some other places. And um, I, I think it does work as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I would tend to agree. Um, it's, a, it's a collaborative sort of a, a process. And um, I'd echo what uh, Chasset as well as um, Jack had said that, you know, while it isn't necessarily perfect, um, and there is room for, an imp for improvement in many of these areas, uh, really it works pretty well. And, but it, what, what it relies on, though, is it needs, um, everyone that's a participant in that process, whether they be police, uh, prosecutors, um, 
probation officers, public defenders, judges, you know, you know, it requires constant attention. And when those people all um, attend to their responsibilities and do it in a conscientious way, then the system works very well. Where, where there are sort of failures along that way, uh, along that path, then um, problems can arise and, uh, and from um, differing points of view, perhaps injustice can occur. But it's the process that's what, what protects us. And as long as we are mindful of that, then um, overall I think the process uh, serves most people pretty well. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I'm from the ACLU of Hawaii, the American Civil Liberties Union, and so we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization that here in Hawaii for over 50 years we have defended the civil rights and civil liberties of everyone. Uh, and so we come from, to this issue from a civil rights perspective, a constitutional perspective. And, and in that respect, I, I do think there are two ways in which perhaps the system could improve and is not working right. Some practices, I think, uh, are not working because they are violating people's constitutional rights, perhaps on a semi-regular basis. And also some criminal laws and policies are really not making us safer. And, and by that I mean, you know, they, they are really not preventing crime from happening in the first place. Now, the good news is that, you know, I, I think we are at a crossroads and we have made some headway in the past few years. Uh, and not just here in Hawaii, but nationwide. And so we really have a good opportunity to make changes that will make the system more constitutional, more humane and effective. You know, and I think, uh, no doubt, uh, today part of the problem is issues that have arisen uh, either externally or internally for, uh, and have been building for quite some time now. And then to deal with those problems is very, very expensive. And of course, as we talked about, very, very complicated. And there's, uh, you know, you turn on the news one day and you, you pick an issue as to what people want to fund and why they feel that should be funded first mm -hmm. and why that's the most important problem. Um, I, I mean, is there, would you, would you pick a particular area that you feel in recent years has, has made the most progress that sticks out to you? Um, or on the flip side, that you feel has become uh, one of the biggest issues right now within our communities? when it comes to um, you know, people leading to incarceration? Well, there's, there's multiple issues that we can yeah. focus on. And mm -hmm. it, when it comes to resources, our judiciary is, uh, the, they're stretched thin as it is. And a lot of our cases, uh, what, what happens in courts is that a lot, in some of our courts, is that cases are dismissed because of congestion. So that's one of the issues that, that we wanted to look at. Uh, and I think that's a real problem because cases are dismissed uh, because there's not enough courtrooms, not enough judges to hear these trials. Uh, and it's really, uh, for some of our cases that are really important, like domestic violence. Our domestic violence misdemeanor calendar, there's three courtrooms. Wow. And in some weeks, they, they have 50 trial cases that they have to hear. And it's impossible for all these cases to be resolved. And so what happens is cases are dismissed, uh, or they're continued, they're postponed. And it frustrates the process, like Judge Trader was saying. The process is important, but when it's frustrated, you know, our victims, our witnesses become frustrated as well, understandably, and uh, it, it affects uh, how the system works in that sense. And, and cases that are dismissed, it means that offenders, they walk away without being held accountable for their actions. So I think uh, court congestion is one of, the, uh, one of these issues that needs to be addressed, and the judiciary's resources um, that's one of the issues that we need to look at. And, you know, if I could jump in here, while, while court calendars are very heavy, um, I think um, what Chasset is saying as far as congestion being a problem, I think it really depends on what calendars you're looking at. Uh, I can tell you on the circuit court criminal calendar, uh, court congestion is really not a big issue. And what I say, when I say that is, is that, um, Judges, um, as well as attorneys, are required by law to, uh, to do their utmost to ensure that the uh, defendant's right to a speedy trial is, is afforded to them. And uh, yes, there are select cases that, um, where violations occur and cases may get dismissed, but it is by far and away uh, the exception on the uh, circuit court criminal calendar. Now, in some calendars, for example, the domestic violence calendar, or as um, 
most, I think, recently, a couple months ago, there was a relatively high-profile DUI case that, that, that surfaced. Um, when cases are dismissed and uh, they're not on the merits, that doesn't serve really, uh, I think, the, the, the broader purpose. For the offender, um, yes, they, they're not held to account. But um, looking at why that happens on particular calendars, I think you know, it's easy to make a broad statement. But really, you have to drill down and sort of see what's happening on uh, specific calendars. Because while it may happen on some, it is not, I think, a um, major issue on others. Right, but it's a, it is a question of resources that need to be applied in certain, I agree. In certain courtrooms and calendars. So domestic violence is one, the UI courts is the other. And I think that I, I, I looked up uh, some funding numbers uh, recently, I think for 2016, 2017, it was about 30, 31 million or so um, um, that's been allocated, a combination of, of state funds and also federal funds. Is that, uh, where are we at overall as far as um, the types of resources that you're seeing in recent years? Is it, is it going up, is it going down, or is it kind of stable? Uh, it, it, I mean, it's going down, it's and going we down. need more, I can tell you this right now, we need more substance abuse uh, treatment programs, mental health treatment programs. Why do you think programs. it's going down? Because I, I don't think that, uh, well, whatever fund, federal funding came from, I don't think that's the current priority of, of the federal government. So you've seen that too, and on the federal the state, and state level. And the five. state is stretched, yeah. and according to what they say, very thin, um, where they're having to choose where to put the money. But uh, we're not going to solve a lot. So many of the, the people that we serve come into our office and they've, the, the, whatever they've done, are done because of alcoholism, mm. uh, drug abuse, uh, oftentimes mental health, not to the point where they're insane, where they're, they're placed in a state hospital, but uh, you know, they, they have these, these, these problems and there's nowhere to put them. We go to court, tell the judge, judge, my client has a, mm -hmm. uh, has a bad problem with alcohol. Well, find a program for him, it takes money. We can't find anywhere for him. So they end up just being, placed on probation, back in the community, the whole cycle starts again. And, so, and that's yeah. something we'll talk a little bit more um, with the whole uh, several year discussion and efforts toward the justice uh, you know, reinvestment initiative and, and what did and didn't work or what has and hasn't right. worked so far and, and why that's a complicated situation. But let, let's, let's go to a few um, graphics that we have here to kind of talk about some of the numbers and and, and, and what we're, we're dealing with here. Let's take a look at this first graphic here. This has to do with the um, uh, prison population, the head count here, and I think what what in this particular graphic, uh, what what stands out to me is is that 25 percent there. That is pretrial uh, felonies, meaning uh, for people who don't quite know, those are people who are, have been charged with a felony, correct, and are waiting for trial. Right. And and I believe with O Triple C that might represent about 500 or so people, which is close to half of the population that is in O Triple C right now. That is a huge slice of people that are taking up space within the prison system. What's, what's going on there? Well, so, if, if I may, yeah. uh, actually the ACLU of Hawaii released a report earlier this year uh, on, bail, uh, uh, you know, on, on bail in Hawaii and bail practices. Uh, <laughs> and it focuses particularly on felony pretrial detainees. Uh, and what we found is that unfortunately, and, and as you said, you know, these are, uh, people that have been accused of a crime, but they haven't necessarily been found guilty of that crime. Right. Uh, and, and bail, the purpose of bail is to make sure that the person shows up in court and also make sure that it, you know, that person doesn't hurt or harm anyone else. Uh, that's really the purpose of bail. And when it comes to cash bail, uh, which is you know, a monetary amount that you pay to get out of jail, really is just so that you show up. Because in fact, even if you commit another crime, you still get the money back. Yeah. So, uh, and, and what we found is that we are over relying on cash bail and that the bail amounts are very high. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the folks in that 25% really cannot afford the bail. And, and you know, that practice can be unconstitutional. One of the ways it can be unconstitutional is if you're just setting an amount without looking at the individual circumstances of that person and whether that person can afford or But that's tough because bail. that's going to be, at least to a certain extent, an opinion. Um, I mean, obviously it's based on the law uh, and, and the 
you know, the guidelines for judges and people in the courtroom, but still, there is some interpretation there that's going to happen. In terms of... Uh, as far as what that's going to, where that's going to be set and why, and when you're looking at the individual and assessing... Um, it is tough, <coughs> uh, and that's why many states are actually moving away from cash bail, mm -hmm. uh, with the idea that they, there can be other conditions of release that are more effective. Uh, things like GPS monitoring, things like, you know, house arrest. Uh, there are other options that are not cash and that have been found more effective in terms of protecting the community. Because if you really think about it, you know, you can have two people, uh, one dangerous but wealthy, one not that dangerous but poor. And the, the dangerous, and both accused of the same crime. If, they, if you set the bail amount at the same amount, which happens all, you know, a lot of the time here in Hawaii, the you wealthy, per then, yeah, dangerous person can get out. The the poor but you know, not dangerous person might stay in jail. That's tough though. Right. That's tough though because you're, you're basing it on the crime. You are, <clears throat> and that's just one of the factors that our courts uh, and our system looks at when setting bail. You base it on the crime and the facts of that offense, but also on a person's history. Yeah. So if a person cannot afford bail, the other question is why is it set? so high. Right. Previous, is it based on previous convictions sometimes? And it's based on previous convictions, yeah. it's based on previous arrests, uh, and, it, and what our courts are trying to do is determine and really try to make a prediction on how dangerous this person is in, our, in, our, in the public and what's the likelihood that this person is going to reappear based on the snapshot of their history. Uh, so it is a difficult determination. Mm -hmm. uh, but and, and as far as the, what they've been trying to do with the uh, Justice Reinvestment um, Initiative, it's hard not to get into that because it's kind of all aspects of this. That was one of the issues that it was trying to address, right, is to, to move that process along a little faster. Um, and justice, to, to avoid the Justice Re uh, Reinvestment Initiative was a couple of years back, and yeah. I think the governor at that time started this movement. Uh, it was happening across the country. So one of the ways that they wanted to address uh, pretrial detainees was to have a system uh, where an arrestee would be evaluated and there would be an assessment. And, and, that's what's, and that's what's been happening for a few years now. The Oahu Intake Service Center will evaluate a person based on several factors. Uh, but one of the issues we see, uh, and that was cited in the Department of Public Safety's report, um, was, and the number they gave was 40% of those arrestees who were screened uh, was recommended for release to a treatment facility. 40% were recommended for release to a treatment facility. The problem is, like Jack had mentioned, there are no facilities or there's not enough space in the facilities that exist now. My understanding that, as we discussed earlier, that was one of the, one of the biggest criticisms with the Justice Reinvestment um, Initiative at the time was that it, it, it created this, this movement, mm -hmm. but it didn't fund uh, what needed to happen after that once these but, but it still had a, a very significant impact because the, the, what, it, uh, the, what Mateo just mentioned about um, bail reform and the ACLU report is a very hot topic right now and in fact uh, I can say that because I currently chair uh, a statewide task force that was um, created um, by a joint um, house resolution to study uh, pretrial uh, justice practices and with an emphasis on uh, taking a look at uh, how these practices um, uh, affect um, the, the way individuals are, are, are treated. And um, certainly everyone wants to have people that are treated fairly. And there are examples where perhaps the system isn't working and I think it needs work. But we are currently in process uh, of looking at all of these things. And um, the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, one of the biggest things that came out of that was the, the creation of a statute that required a um, risk assessment to be run on all individuals within three working days of coming into a correctional center. And then uh, essentially, based upon how uh, that individual is scored based upon this validated risk assessment tool, then recommendations are made for detention or release. And my understanding, that's been one of the bright spots in that it has uh, made a, a difference that people can quantify. That, that's, been, yeah. uh, that's been very, very helpful. But it's like everything else. We need to stay sort of vig vigilant and, and continue to work on this because uh, the concern is uh, with the number of individuals that are currently being held, okay, um, it costs money 
to, to hold individuals, not just uh, in terms of what it costs to house an individual, but there are also societal costs that are associated with detention beyond that which, which is necessary because people can lose their jobs, and they that, can that, lose housing, benefits, things of that nature that can have a huge impact on them going forward. The ones that are dangerous and, and should not be released, mm -hmm. those individuals should remain in, but those people that can be safely uh, managed in the community. And the research out there is, has been demonstrating that it is possible to release um, many of these low-risk offenders and they will come back to court and their risk of reoffense is relatively low. But um, it's, a, it's a work in progress. There are many uh, very um, knowledgeable and experienced people that are, are taking a look at these issues and we, we hope to be able to produce a report at the end of this year that will benefit um, the legislature as they begin to look at at ways to tackle these things. A lot of pressure uh, from the community and, and the public as well as far as there is. The, the risk level that they're willing to, to, right. to accept. Well, let's take a couple, look at a couple more graphics here. The next two are, are, are fairly related and we're talking about what's happening with the prison population. Uh, this one here in particular, this is the, uh, uh, a graph showing um, the, uh, the felonies and the prisoners, I think in, uh, was is the federal? Yeah, this is Arizona, that's right. And so, I mean, this has definitely been um, a big point of discussion for quite some time now is whether or not we should be sending prisoners to the mainland, what effect that has, oh, but also the reality of, if we just go ahead and take a look at the next graphic, uh, the, the overcrowding that we're dealing with here and why um, some of these things have had to happen because of that. There's the graphic there. And so in particular, you take a look at some of the um, the community facilities, I mean, those are some pretty big numbers uh, th th as far as what these facilities are designed to hold and what they're actually holding. And I, I think, I'm sure all of you have seen the type of impact that has and the challenge is trying to deal with that right now. Right, I, yeah, well, right. I, I, I think, <clears throat> I, I've always felt it's been, it's a terrible situation where we have to send uh, our inmates uh, to Arizona, yeah. out of state. Talk about that separation yeah. from the community it, and family. It's, they're separated from their family, from whatever support system they have. It's not like the mainland where families can drive to a, a neighboring state or county to see their, their uh, family member. It, very few family members have the means to fly to Arizona and to, to, to see their loved one. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's a, I guess it's a necessity uh, because of the overcrowding, but it's it's far from ideal, and um, it it doesn't help with the re rehabilitation of any of these prisoners. Right, and so, so I, and I think a part of the discussion when we're talking about what we can do to improve our system uh, is bail reform is one, but another uh, another issue we have to look at <coughs> is the need for a newer or maybe, maybe more modern facilities that have more space. Uh, because deteriorating conditions, uh, infrastructures that are falling apart, those environments are not conducive to rehabilitation. Uh, they might breed cultures of resentment and people, the focus is not on redemption and rehabilitation. I think Maui in particular, I've heard, would right. be really tough. Right. And so cramped conditions, they, yeah. that's not gonna help uh, our inmates uh, when they are re-entering back into our communities because they need to have the tools so that recidivism rates uh, can be reduced and I think the important the importance here is that we have to look at maybe a newer facility more modern better designs that focus on this rehabilitation efforts uh, and reduce that culture of fear you know as far as building a, a new prison or creating another facility or the funding for that that, that seems fairly obvious that that has needed to happen for quite some time are, is this is this just a money issue that's really holding this up or, or what else do you think at this point, um, when we've gotten to this point, it's still holding up the process. I think it's political will, uh, mainly based in, in money, uh, but also you have the, the what they call the NIMBY effect, not in my mm -hmm. backyard. Nobody wants a prison near where they live. Um, but it, it, you know, sooner or later, the, the longer the state waits, the more it's gonna cost. It's just like everything else, and uh, um, there has to be some political will to get this done because 
it, the situation isn't going to get better and it's going to get worse by the year. And, and there's currently a, another task force that's being um, headed up right now um, by uh, Justice Wilson of the Supreme Court and their, their focus is on, among other things, uh, design and uh, recommendations regarding uh, uh, a new detention facility here on Oahu. Um, you know, because uh, we are beyond the capacity. I mean, the Department of Public Safety does the very best they can. But, you know, there is a cost, and the monetary cost is one thing. But um, if you're going to have any system that, that is going to incarcerate individuals, we have to have a, a safe and a humane place to house them and treat them. And very good arguments can be made now that we're probably not doing as good a job as we would like to. And, you know, one answer is perhaps uh, more capacity. But that's not that simple because really what you have to take a look at is what is the purpose or objective of the criminal justice system? Depending upon what your, you, your opinion is about that, uh, that impacts uh, essentially where those resources should go. And so uh, many good arguments can be made as to whether or not incarceration is, is helpful if, for a lot of these offenders um, and that that money could be much better spent, uh, for example, like Jack indicated, uh, to create more resources for, for treatment options. You, you know, if, if nothing else, the 90s told us that, you know, with the interest in, in mandatory sentencing for especially drug offenses, that you cannot incarcerate your way out of, of these types of problems. It requires a lot of different things to, to, to attack it. And, and jail is one thing. It can afford you know, some deterrence for certain offenders, but really at the core what we're lacking is uh, capacity for treatment, uh, to, to be able to change um, the way people think and they behave. Compliance is, is fine, but Changing people's behavior is really what we need to do. You know, and you, uh, you're you leading to an area that we're definitely going to get a little more into as far as the drug situation here in the state and some of the other issues, homelessness, that have really uh, no doubt put a burden mm -hmm. on the system. I, I want to uh, have you listen to um, uh, 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 an interview, another insight show where Judge Kubo was talking and he, as you all know, oversees the uh, drug court and he was part of an insights panel. This is back in November, not that long ago, and we asked him about the current state of Hawaii's drug problem, particularly about crystal meth. So take a listen. I think we're starting to backslide mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as the, the drug use of uh, ice is concerned. Uh, in the two th early 2000s, you know, we, we had a bad problem. We had town hall meetings almost every week at, in some place in this state. And I remember the cries of the parents. I remember the, the heartaches. I remember the kids getting in trouble. And we all came together, you know, not only law enforcement, but uh, providers and the community and parents and and we were able to do things but I think over the years you can only keep that drumbeat up for so long before you start getting fatigue mm -hmm. and so um, I think either that or com some form of complacency and so the cries are not loud anymore and what you're seeing is drug dealers or um, at least as far as us judges, we're still seeing a high percentage of methamphetamine uh, abusers who are committing crimes. And this is troubling because this is affecting the next generation. So your thoughts? Um, so, you know, in, in Hawaii about 22 percent of criminal cases uh, are drug related. 22 percent. 22 percent in circuit court, I should say. Uh, and there are about 24 percent of all convictions. So they are, represent a big chunk and overwhelmingly is for possession. This is not necessarily drug dealers. Uh, and so really what you see in terms of what the judge was saying is that criminalization of drugs hasn't really been working uh, in the sense that, you know, addiction is really a very complex public health matter and kind of the blunt tool of criminalization makes what is already a difficult problem sometimes worse. 
Uh, What's interesting is because there's now a mandatory sentence, isn't that right? And that was expected to have a, a, an impact on these types of cases, but it doesn't seem to have had an impact. And precisely, it is because it's dealing with addiction. And so even, you know, the deterrent effect of a mandatory sentence doesn't work with someone that is addicted to meth, addicted to, you know, whatever substance. Uh, Do you think in, in particular with this drug, it's a particular problem because of the strength of the drug, or is it just... No, I, you know, <clears throat> I always say that the addiction, whether it's uh, a, a drug or whether it's alcohol, is more powerful than any law that can be passed. Uh, because uh, when we meet with, with clients, they, they never thought of, oh, I might get a mandatory sentence, or this is my third DUI conviction, I might get jail time. Um, it, it, it just never crosses their mind. It's, it's the addiction to the substance that's more powerful than anything else. So I need to get to some of these of uh, your questions uh, soon here, but I did want to, on, on that note, I did want to ask you about this movement, at least in some areas in this country, toward treating this now as a public health um, issue instead of um, a, a criminal issue. Uh, are, are we moving enough in that direction? Do you see enough movement happening? Do you, do you think that that's how we should be looking at this? I think that's exactly how we should be looking at it. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, what Matteo referred to in terms of the drug convictions, those are, I think he was referring to convictions which only state a drug offense, but there are many property offenses like burglaries, thefts, um, uh, you know, criminal property damage, people are drunk, mm -hmm. all, all types of various other types of criminal offenses that have their root in addiction. Right. So yeah. you're actually talking about a, a whole, uh, a lot more offenses uh, rather than just the drug offenses that, that have their root in addiction. So you're gonna get those offenses that there need to be criminal sanctions yep. on. So, but the, the concept of treating the underlying cause I think uh, it, it, there should be a movement toward treating it as a public health situation. And one size doesn't fit all. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really f the key because um, when judges do not have discretion and they are re required by law to send an individual who's clearly an addict uh, to prison, um, while that uh, removes them from society for a period of time and they may have less access to their drug of choice, unless they get the appropriate treatment, they're going to come out and they're likely to, to continue uh, on that path. But I, I disagree somewhat uh, with respect to what Jack said about it being, it should be treated as a public health issue. It is a serious public health issue, but it is also a criminal justice uh -huh. issue because people that uh, are um, are engaged in these types of uh, crimes or drug use, for example, if they're not working, how are they paying for uh, those drugs? They're committing other crimes. And some of them are property crimes, but um, you know, there's a point at which where um, it is a legitimate criminal justice issue to hold these individuals to account and not to excuse the behavior simply because they're addicted to a substance. It's a complicated set of issues and all of them need to be looked at and that's when I think what's good about uh, the shift more recent in more recent years is we recognize the benefits of uh, a more of a multidisciplinary approach to these things. Courts nowadays for example uh, the, the system of justice has changed so much. Police used to arrest, prosecutors would prosecute and the courts would adjudicate. That has changed tremendously in the last 20 years. We have now shifted away from that as our primary um, goal, or excuse me, our objective, to now where we are involved in many other things, uh, specialty courts, for example, trying to figure out different ways, different tools to combat these very, very you know, serious and, and long-standing problems. And those require resources. Well, let me ask you this. I'm going to get to some of these questions because there's a, there's a whole lot. Um, this is from Nikos. This is a a long question. What policies have prosecutors and uh, probation officials followed in recent years to help ensure that incarceration is not overutilized, given the high cost to taxpayers and burdens placed on family members? 
are standardized risk assessment tools used and how do they impact decision making? Right, uh, well, there are standardized uh, risk assessment tools. Like we discussed, it was a result of the Justice Re, uh, Reinvestment Initiative. Uh, but that's one of the ways in which we try to help uh, alleviate this burden, this overcrowding. Uh, we also have programs like community out the community courts, uh, where we work together with the public defenders, with the judiciary, and we try to target the backlog of cases that are in district court. We try to help people who have homeless issues, people who have substance abuse issues, by giving them connections to social services. And this is by working together, we can get benefits like this that affect uh, the overpopulation in, in, our, in our jails and prisons. It can affect backlogs in our court. So there are uh, initiatives that are being taken to address these issues. It's tough though, isn't it, when you have individuals who don't want to take the medication, aren't seeking tre treatment for possible uh, mental illness, who are on the streets and don't have an, an obvious solution, or don't want to get off the street but for that matter. It, so uh, no doubt it's You know, it's one of the things that the system has done, and, and I'd ask Jack to comment on this too if he would, is that, you know, we have ha been looking at for a long time uh, different ways to address these problems. And one of the most successful programs that we've had in, in recent years has been the Hope Probation Program, which is a very highly structured, um, intensive um, supervision of probation uh, offenders. And what it relies on is swift, certain, and proportional sanctions for violations. And so when an individual, for example, comes in and tests dirty, they're immediately arrested. So there's an immediate consequence to that. They're taken before a judge. And if the individual admits, then their sanction is basically re reflects that. It'll be three to five days in jail. And then they're directed to go out and get an assessment and do whatever else is needed. Uh, versus somebody who comes in and, and says that, um, I don't know how I tested positive for meth. We're going to send it to the lab. We're going to find out. That person is not being truthful and honest, then that's a different discussion. So the sanction is going to be more serious. It's going to be 15 days, basically. Offenders buy into that because they feel that they're being treated fairly, and it also is a more um, timely response to the behavior at hand. And many of these people can be managed very well uh, when they have the benefit of that type of supervision. Jack, do you agree? Yeah. No, I, I agree. And uh, that's getting back to Mateo's point in terms of incarcerating all these people. There are alternatives to incarceration, and HOPE is an uh, excellent example of that. With more intensive supervision, uh, you can place people in the, in the community, uh, but like everything else, even the HOPE court right now is, is right. I mean, it's underfunded. We need more judges, more public defenders in those right. courts because uh, you know, if, if you're going to place more people under intensive supervision, then you need more people manning that particular court and you need more judges. So here's so, a tough one yeah. for Ted. He says, I moved from L.A. to Kona 24 years ago. Judges here, in his opinion, he says judges here are far too lenient. Mm -hmm. Sentences are too light. And while out on bail, perpetrators will often commit more crimes. And just kind of to tag on to this, Mark said, recidivism is the biggest issue in the, quote, revolving door syndrome, what's being done to address rehabilitation, which you touched on, um, Chasset. But, I mean, this is just, just goes to, sh to show you the difficulties in the, in the public perception and how the community is feeling about um, how to deal with, uh, you know, criminals and, and possibly letting them out sooner and the, the difficulties that I, no doubt lawmakers also had because that public pressure was on. You know, and it's very understandable why people might view a judge's sentence as being uh, too lenient because they're basing that um, conclusion upon what's reported in the media or what else is available. But judges are provided with uh, a, a lot of other information including a, a very comprehensive and, and carefully drafted um, pre-sentence report, which only goes to the individuals in the case and the judge. And there's often a confidential recommendation that's made there. And the judge has the benefit of all of that information. So when he or she makes the decision, trying to assess what risks this person presents, are they dangerous or not, what options exist to address those um, criminogenic risk factors. 
Um, then uh, hearing from the victims, hearing from the defendant, hearing from the family, uh, looking at the options available decides upon an appropriate sentence. And when um, an individual uh, out in the public hears about that, they don't know uh, what all that information is. So it's very easy for people to uh, come away from that thinking that the judge did not um, seriously entertain more severe consequences when in fact sentencing is probably the most uh, important decision uh, judges make on a daily basis. And here's no doubt the fine line that, that all of you are walking. Uh, this, is, this is from Kevin. He says, why is the panel more concerned about the inmate, inmates than they are about the victims? Uh, the problems are about the failure of families to teach their children morals. That actually sounds like two issues going on mm -hmm. there. But before I have you uh, uh, answer that, I want to make sure I get to this. Um, we were um, we appreciate all of you being here, of course. The probation office, by the way, declined to, to send a representative, but recommended that you be here because of your experience. You're, you're heading up the criminal uh, pretrial task force, examining criminal pretrial practices and procedures. We kind of touched on that. Um, and, you know, we want to talk about what it is you, that you're focusing on, but I think one of the issues, too, in this is when you're dealing with um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, bail that we touched on, what should be the right um, amount, the issues with being able to pay that, and then also, you know, some of the comments that we've got on, on the people out in the community not always wanting um, people to be released early, not always wanting the bail to be set low so they can get out because that's the environment um, that may have been connected to why it happened in the first place, and they're concerned. So there's, there's an interesting uh, flip side to all of this. Right. That no doubt um, the families are also very concerned about. And how do you then gauge that? Right. And, and it's important, like the, the uh, question that came in, it's important not to lose focus of mm -hmm. what public safety is concerned about, which is public uh, safety, but also to focus on our victims and the mm -hmm. victims of crime. So any, any kind of policy discussions we have, that focus should be on protecting the public and ensuring that victims and witnesses are also protected like with the bail reform and the discussions that we're having about it, there's a tendency for that discussion to be driven by prison overcrowding. Uh, but the problem with that is shifting the focus away from uh, public safety and talking about and focusing on our victims. We definitely should have that discussion about uh, bail reform and, and prison overcrowding, but the focus should always be on keeping our public safe and keeping victims and witnesses um, again, in our focus moving forward. Well, and in this respect, I think one of the good news is that there are reforms that make us safer, you know, protect victims, and, and still lead to better results down the road. Uh, and so those are the things I think we should be looking at. And those are things that are being tried uh, across the nation and that how I can learn from. And, you know, the, some of them are experiments, some of them are, you know, new. Right. But we're getting data, and, and we can actually tell if, in fact, there are fewer crimes. And what we're seeing is positive results. So uh, as far as uh, some of the areas of concern, uh, people who are getting multiple convictions, people who are violating their parole, uh, recidivism, getting back into the system, where, where are we generally at? Are, we, are, are those numbers improving, or are we seeing sort of different things happening? And, and what's your take on that? I have some numbers. Uh, I, I, for example, know that you know every year we released about a thousand individuals from prison either on parole or because they served their maximum sentence. That's more or less. And unfortunately, you know, our, our rate of reoffense of recidivism is for those individuals is about sixty percent. Uh, if you include probationers, it's about fifty percent. Uh, that's kind of average. It's not, you know, higher than the national average or below the national average. That being said, we could be doing a lot better. Uh, you know, 50% is still very, very high. And, and I think that speaks to the fact that, again, our prisons and jails are overcrowded and over underfunded. You know, they, they don't have the programming necessary to actually rehabilitate people. And I, th I think that's something that here everyone on this table would agree. Well, one of the most important things is, is that, you know, we, we're, we're fortunate now because there's a lot of research that's going on. And, you know, whether it's police, prosecutors, judges, uh, even um, 
defense counsel. I mean, we, we've been working in a system that uh, is, you know, has its roots many decades ago. But we now have the benefit of research that, that, that can help guide us to, to tell us whether or not the practices that we actually are engaging on, are they effective? Because sometimes you do things that, for example, uh, make you feel like you are perhaps um, doing the appropriate thing when the research may suggest otherwise. Um, for example, you know, um, when people are released uh, from custody and on supervision to an individual or to a program, um, the courts typically uh, will impose a, a number of terms and conditions that are, from a common sense standpoint, designed to address the uh, risks that they present to, to get them to address their drug addiction or mental health issues, things of that sort. But what the research shows is that while that may be the intention, what happens is in some of these offenders, uh, the imposition of a number of these conditions is actually counterproductive. Mm. In other words, it has nothing to do with whether or not the individual is going to return to court, whether or not he or she is uh, at a higher risk of committing a new offense or hurting somebody. And so it's, you know, we, we have to look at a lot of different things and evidence-based practices is is really uh, a big part of that and you know there are efforts underway I, I also co-chair a, a, a committee um, that is looking at and is dedicated to try to reduce recidivism through the use here's of these an, practices. Here's an interesting question from Larry from my pa, who he said uh, he said look at how many folks have been arrested um, throughout some numbers that are on the streets right now and his take is that they don't fear the justice system in Hawaii what is, what's your response to that, that there may be, um, for whatever reason, for you know, where we are in our society right now, maybe desensitized to what we see, on t who knows what? Do you think that's, there's some validity to that assessment, that, that maybe people don't fear the justice system as much as they used to? No, I mean, I, I don't think that's, that's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation when you're arrested by the police. Uh, but, you know, one of your viewers earlier made a comment about there's so much breakdown in the family now. Mm -hmm. And I think that was an excellent point because we're now in a generation where many of the kids, the young people that we see coming through the system, their parents were drug addicts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes both mother and father were were. Uh, addicted. And this is a comment really quickly right. to interrupt yeah. you by um, an individual. Focus needs to be on the way people are raised. Respect mm -hmm. for the law needs to be taught and should begin when they were young. Exactly. Just kind of fits into and, what you're and, talking about. And so, you know, they, they've grown up in a, in a very dysfunctional environment. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes girls, young girls, run away mm -hmm. because they're being sexually and physically abused. Uh, males will run away also because they're being physically abused at home. So it, it's, and these are so many of, of the, the people that we serve in, in the justice system. When we see their, rep, their backgrounds in these pre-sentence reports, the, these are the environments they come from. But, so what then we're trying to do is play catch up and trying to change the attitudes or behavior that were caused by these environments. And that's a very difficult system for government to do. I want to add this really quickly too. Justice system, this is from another um, viewer. The justice system couldn't be more broken, but the <coughs> real fix, this person believes, lies in education. That's part of it, but it's no one component is to blame. The, the, the viewer that talked about an erosion of basic, you know, values and upbringing, all of that is correct because when you look at the, the individuals that we see on a regular basis, the common threads that we see as part of that fabric are unemployment, um, education levels that many do not even graduate, substance abuse at an early age, exposure to a, a dysfunctional family environment. And all of those things put pressure on an individual uh, such that a lot of these individuals end up committing crimes. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people necessarily, but we have to understand that um, um, we're just seeing sort of the, 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 the sort of symptom, but really the root cause is a lot more involved. And, and education, I couldn't agree more, but that alone will not fix it.
Here's a quick question from Rick from Hilo. Why aren't inmates on work furlough not equipped with tracking devices? This is probably a resources issue as well uh, that we talked about before. The resources that are given to our Department of Public Safety is just not enough to equip all these inmates with uh, tracking devices. And it's not just resources for those devices, but resources for services and programming that these inmates need so that when they are released, you know, they have the tools they need uh, to, mm -hmm. right, to become more productive members of our society. What precautions are taken in a serious crime to prevent suspects from leaving the city while released on their own recognizance? If, uh, if a person is arrested pending, pending trial and they're released on bail, one of the mandatory conditions is that they can't leave the jurisdiction without permission of the court. I think this probably comes up because of the case that we had what, a few months ago with uh, the individual who left, uh, Saito, who left the uh, mm -hmm. mental health facility, no they, doubt. They, they need to get court permission yeah. anytime they're on release to, to leave. But that's, that was a different situation. That's a whole different right? situation. This is true. But, but, you know, again, it comes down to fundamental respect for, you know, the process in these institutions because... And I think that was the concern by one of the viewers. A that piece of... people aren't for example, the gravity of it. When somebody a has a restraining order, <clears throat> <clears throat> That's a piece of paper, but that isn't going to protect her or him when the person who's restrained from having contact knocks on their door at 2 o'clock in the morning. If they don't respect the order, then um, you know, that order in and of itself is not going to, to solve the problem. Uh, you know, and we have to be mindful of these things and do the best we can to try to manage these issues from a variety of standpoints. Well, unfortunately, we, there, there's so much more we wanted to get to, but it, this all uh, moves so quickly. I just wanted to ask um, some of you this question. Overnight, of overnight, mm -hmm. you could fix one thing about the local criminal justice system, what would it be? What's on the top of your list? Mm -hmm. I know it's tough to pick one because they're all interconnected. Well, if I could just sort of say that, um, not to say that there aren't other serious issues, but since drug and alcohol um, abuse and addiction rears its head in so many of the, the cases we see, um, it would be very helpful to be able to have uh, additional treatment options. On Oahu, we're fortunate. That was a question from a lot of people, is, is a lot of focus on rehabilitation. What's happening with that? And I know you all touched on that, but I know that's tough because it takes resources and political will. But it's where you're going to spend the money. You're yeah. going to build a, a brick and mortar facility or you, are you going to pay for treatment programs? That's the, the choice that oftentimes people are left with. Your thoughts, Chasa, too? I'm sorry to... Right, to and sure, it is a question a about resources. Left, so. It's a question about resources, and it doesn't come down to just treatment or a newer facility. We can approach these complex issues by looking at all fronts. So maybe it is a newer facility that's designed more about focusing on rehabilitation and helping give treatment and services and programming that is necessary. So I think resources is the issue. The resources to build a facility so that when we need the space to put dangerous people away, we have it. But facilities that are able to provide the kind of services that our inmates need so that when they do re-enter society, that they can do so successfully. What's on the top of your list, Jack? And, you know, I, I think I, the resource thing question is, is a big thing. And, uh, but I approach it a little different where I think a lot more resources need to be put into our juvenile justice system because so many of our adult uh, defendants have, in a sense, graduated from the juvenile justice system. They first get into tr trouble as juveniles, and that, that whole system is even probably more underfunded than the adult system in terms of mental health treatment, substance abuse, and uh, uh, the amount of judges and public defenders, prosecutors that are, that are devoted to that system. But I think there's no we, doubt a lot of these problems start from right. earlier in life. If we can cut it there, then maybe we don't yeah. have as many of the problems as adults. And I'll agree with everyone. It is resources, you know, ultimately. However, I think something has to give. And that's why I do think bail reform is a, perhaps a place Explain where we can look. a little bit more. Not everybody knows what bail reform is. Sure. So, so. The, the basic idea is that, you know, many places around the nation are, uh, to some extent, experimenting. Do an version. Sure, <laughs> experimenting with, you know, releasing more people uh, with certain conditions that make sure that they don't commit another crime and that they show up in court. And in some places like DC and Kentucky, they have been doing this for a long time with good results. 
And, and so there are things you can do to reduce the number of people, that 25% that you showed us, to hopefully much less, and that saves resources that then can be moved elsewhere uh, for programming, for treatment. And so, yes, but I agree with everyone else that you know, it is resources, ultimately because you know, there's only so, many, so much funding, uh, you do need to make reforms. We just have just a little bit of time left, but um, anything else coming up? You mentioned a program, um, Judge, uh, that, or a report that you're working on. Uh, anything else that people can, can focus on right now? Well, what, yeah, what's interesting is that the legislature is, is very uh, inter interested in, in taking a look at, at uh, innovative ways to um, address some of these problems. And there's a lot of folks that are hard at work doing that. One is my task force on uh, pretrial justice. There are many other efforts under underway, uh, but uh, it's um, it's going to take a lot of different things in order to have a sustained, long-term positive effect. But we're working on it. Thank you. Well, mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight, and we thank our guests, Judge Ram Trader, a judge with the First Circuit Court, Chesa Tsipolu, First Deputy Prosecuting Attorney with the City and County of Honolulu, Jack Tadaki from the State Public Defender's Office, and Mateo Caballero from the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii. So next week on Insights, a subject that is difficult to talk about. The leading cause of injury deaths in Hawaii among young people 15 to 24 is suicide. And this young demographic leads all other age groups in attempted suicides. National incidents are on the rise, and Hawaii is no exception to this trend. What we need to know and understand about teen suicide in Hawaii next uh, on Insights. I'm Laurie Amata for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Mahui Home.